You're welcome once again to this channel. My name is Akimwale. Uh, I will be speaking today on Coastal Framework 17 Principles of Effective Internal Control. Coastal uh, ERM Framework is quite popular globally and has been adopted in uh, several uh, sectors uh, across uh, nations of the world. So we have Coastal. What's Coastal? COSO is Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission. All right, that's actually the full meaning of COSO. Uh, COSO is made up of five accounting bodies in America coming together to actually uh, perform like a study on the reasons for failures of um, uh, institutions, corporate entities in the United States. And uh, the collaboration of those five uh, accounting bodies is, was well led to COSO. And uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the popular components of uh, internal control according to COSO. So we have five of them. You have the control environments, you have the risk assessments, you have the control activities, you have the information and communication, uh, then you have the monitoring. All right, so those, those are the five con internal control components according to COSO. Uh, a little bit uh, overview of those of those components. Control environment is simply the environment that is used to direct and control the business. So that is like basically what is happening at the strategic level in the organization. According to COSO, the control environment is the most important um, of the of the components basically, and that is if you look at ISO, if you map that to ISO, we are looking at uh, leadership plus five. All right, so so you can see that there is agreement between COSO ERM framework and uh, um, ISO uh, management uh, system standards. So you have the risk assessment. Uh, basically, what that is saying is that uh, for you to be able to have effective internal control, you must have ongoing risk assessments, all right? Because it's risk assessment that throws up your vulnerabilities and that will help you to be able to uh, recommend applicable controls. Then you have control activities. Like I said, once you have done risk assessments, it helps you to know the risk you are subjected to or you are susceptible to, then you can now start implementing control activities to manage those risks. Then you have information and communication, which must be embedded all right, throughout the organization, top down, bottom up, across the organization, across all levels, all layers. All right, so we need to have technologies for communication. We need to have systems for communication, all right, um, of, of uh, you know, disseminating control information. Then, of course, monitoring, all right. So you need to have, all right, high tech, low tech means of monitoring your internal and external environment. Okay, so that's a brief uh, overview of the five control components. Now, so, so we have the principles, the 17 principles of effective internal control. They are now mapped, all right? They are mapped to each of these uh, control components. So let's start with the first five principles, uh, which are mapped to the control environment. So you have principle one, demonstrates commitment to integrity and values, all right? And like I said, control environment is about the leadership, all right? It's about the corporate governance in the organization. And so it, it starts with the integrity of the directors, the integrity of the owners, the integrity of the shareholders. Everything, all right, is held together by <laughs> the kind of personalities uh, that is uh, that are running the business. So the directors, the shareholders, the CEO, the C suits, CISO, CRO, CTO, right, CMOs, you know, C whatever, all the people are, are that are in the decision making um, um, offices in the organization must be people of integrity and must be ready to, be, to subject themselves to ethical and corporate values. That is what the first principle is and is very important. Once this is not in place, 
All right, every other thing you're doing, you're just wasting your time. We've seen areas where you have good auditors, good internal auditors, all right, but because the corporate control environment is wrong, every other thing will be wrong. Principle number two, all right, demonstrate independence and exercise oversight responsibility. This is also talking about corporate governance. If you look at the corporate governance code, for example, UK corporate, corporate governance code, all right, there is always emphasis across all this corporate governance code about, you know, separation of paths at the board level, all right? So, so you have the, the board of directors managing the escorts, managing the executive committees, all right, led by the CEO. For example, some time ago in Nigeria, we used to have offices of the chairman of the board of director and the CEO of the bank. One person, all right, is holding those two offices until I think 2005, when the corporate governance code for banks in Nigeria, you know, and, you know stated that directed that that should, you know, those two offices should be separated. So it's very important. Then even if you look at the board, all right, we need to have a balance of the non-executive directors and the executive directors. If not, because the executive directors are involved in the daily running of the business, all right, sometimes, all right, the decisions may be clouded. Quote and unquote. And that's why you have the executive directors, which are not supposed to be part of the system. And so they can make more objective decisions on, you know, in the in the, in the what they call to represent what they call public interests. All right. So the non-executive directors are uh, expect to be independent of the executive directors, especially the chairman. All right. <laughs> this is a, this is a talk for you all day. All right, it's a workshop for you all day. And you know, a, a lot of things goes, a lot of things, a lot of businesses, corporate entities globally that 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 fell, all right, collapsed, actually collapsed because of these challenges of you know independence between the board and the schools, all right. Um, the balance of power between the non-executive directors and executive directors. And so the board must be able to exercise oversight responsibility over the schools and the schools, the executive committee all right, led by the CEO should be able to exercise oversight committee, exercise oversight responsibility over the entire organization. All right, number three, principle number three, establishes structural authority and responsibility. So organ organogram is very important. And uh, so of course, the leadership that set up organizational structure a lot of things can go right, a lot of things can go wrong, depending on the conditional structure. Reporting lines, separation of powers, all right, clouds assigned to, to, to offices. For example, the head of internal audits, what kind of cloud does he have? All right, the head of information security, all right, that is more or less balancing powers with the head of IT. What kind of cloud does he or she have? All right, so these are the issues. So structural authority and responsibility must be well balanced within the organization. All right, principle number four, demonstrate commitment to attracting, developing, and retaining competent staff. So this is talking about human resources. So the leadership, remember we are seeing in control environment, the leadership must be ready to reward, attract, and reward people. Right, uh, you know, it's a big challenge for many organizations because they see uh, money being spent on staff, training, you no know, salary, as flow. But really, you shouldn't see it as half free. It's actually an investment, basically. All right, and that's how you see the topmost organization in the world today. You go there, you know, people want to stay because of the environment, the reward system, the training system. All right, uh, so you must be ready to invest. All right, in your people. Then number five, principle, the fifth principle is enforces accountability. People must, people's actions must be traceable in the organization. There must be reward for doing right, things right. There must be penalties for doing things wrong. So you don't want chaos in the organization. You don't want a carefree attitude where people can do whatever they like, all right, <laughs> resume whatever they like, do whatever they like, submit reports, whatever they like, miss their life, whatever they, no, whatever they like. That is not how to run an organization. People must be responsible for their actions and inactions. So those are the five principles that are mapped to the control environment. Then you have 
principle six to nine map to risk assessment, which is very, very important. So principle six specifies suitable specific objectives. So we need to know uh, the business objectives. We need to know the risk management objectives. Of course, the risk management objectives must be aligned with the, with the business objectives. So for example, things like uh, risk appetite of the organization. So risk appetite is a trendy stuff now in the risk management climb. So risk appetite statement should be written, should be approved, should be publicized. So everybody knows, all right, the level of risk the business is ready to take. Everybody knows our risk management objectives. All right, everybody is aware of the business objectives. Everybody can map the risk management objectives to the business objective. Principle seven, Identify and analyze. This is very important. So as a business, all right, you need to be able to have resources to identify the risks that are subject to you. That's what they call inherent risk. Inherent risk is a risk that is, you know, it comes naturally with process, with a business. You start a bank, expect fraud, all right? You are a footballer, right? What is the inherent risk in footballing? All right, that's basically injury, okay? Uh, you start an insurance company that could be a false claim against the business. All right, um, shipping, maritime industry, risk of, uh, you know, uh, storms, you know, uh, maybe pirate hijack and things like that. So every sector, every business have the risks that are inherent in it. And so as, as an entity, you need to be able to have resources, you need to have department, all right, that is saddled with that responsibility. Of course, they will tell you in risk management, that risk management is everybody's responsibility. So we need to be able to identify and analyze risk. And this was another topic for, you know, a whole week. All right, let's me move on to principle eight, assesses for risk. Now, for risk is inherent to every business. I don't think there's any business that, that doesn't have for risk. Of course, the level all right, of, of susceptibility to fall risk uh, differs across different sectors, depending on how the system is structured. So every organization needs to be ready uh, to assess for the risk that people will commit fraud in the organization and what you are going to do to prevent it or to de and also to detect it. That's principle eight. Principle nine is identify and analyze significant changes. Changes can overrun and overturn an organization. Your product can become obsolete in your hand. There's all called product of ob ob obsolescence. There's all called technology obsolescence. The technology can become obsolete. Your product can become obsolete. Your services can become obsolete. All right. Um, so so these, these, these are things that you need to be more. That's as I said, you should need to watch your external environment, your internal environment. And so you so we have organizational change management as a course, as a field of management study on its own. How as an organization should respond, all right, to changes in the external and the internal environment. So that is principle number nine. So all these six, seven, eight, nine is mapped to risk assessment component. Then of course we have control environment, control activities, which I say basically is your response to the risks you have identified. So principle 10, select and develop control activities that help with the queries. You have done your risk assessment. So what are the controls you want to in, in, initiate to prevent the risk, to deter the risk, to, you know, Correct the risk. So you have preventive controls, detective controls, you have the uh, corrective controls. So you have, you know, uh, like if you look at 27,001, so you have uh, what is it called? Organizational controls, you have people controls, you have physical controls, you have technological controls. So call it whatever you will, but make sure you have controls that can respond to the risks you have identified on your risk assessment. Principle 11, select and develop general controls over technology. So this is specifically on technology and technology risk is, you know, basically is a baseline for almost all organizations today. We, all of us, one way or the other, we are depending on technology. So we need to be able to uh, have controls to manage technological risks. Principle 12, basis controls on thorough policies and procedures. All right. So uh, some people will even argue that, you know, that is the first line 
of defense, where you, where you are setting up controls, your policies, because your policies and procedures actually dictates you know, the controls you are going to implement based on the risk assessment you have done. So you need to have up-to-date policies and procedures. So principle 10, 11, 12 map to control activities. Then principles, principles 13, 14, 15, map the information and communication. What is going on within the organization? Principle 13 uses relevant high quality information. So we, people need information to act. And that's why you are, you know, that's, so you need training, you need regular awareness for everybody in the organization, all right? As it's 1,000, we say risk management should be inclusive. So everybody in the organization need to have high quality information, all right, to make decisions, okay? Principle 14, communicates internally to support controls. People need information to know what to do. So you don't assume people know what to do, all right? Even people that know what to do, they forget. And people can get used to their expertise that they start taking things for granted. That's why like training and awareness need to be continuous. Communication must be continuous, all right? 15, communicate externally. Sometimes your problem will not be from within the organization. Your problem is coming from outside the organization. If you look at almost all the, the international standards and frameworks, all right, most of them, most, you know, now there is a lot of emphasis now on top party risks, all right, vendor risks, all right, procurement risk, or supply chain risks. So <laughs> you also need to manage, all right, relationships outside the organization, your vendor, the general public, your customers, the government, all right, and all that external stakeholders. That's principle 15. Okay. Principle 16 and 17 map to monitoring, which must be continuous. Great. Number 16, conduct ongoing and or separate evaluations. So you need to be able to have ongoing, all right, all year and, uh, uh, you know, evaluation. You need to have a system of monitoring, a system of review. So you, you, that's why we need the internal control guys, we need the internal audit guys, we need the external audit guys, we need all right, risk management, all right, we need the information security team, the SOC team, all right, and so on, to be able to, so we need technology here, actually, to be able to know what's happening, all right, VAPT, vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, all these add up, all right, to the monitoring um, uh, system. Then finally, uh, principle 17, evaluate and communicate deficiencies. So what is the essence of doing internal audits when the audit reports are not going up? What is the purpose of doing uh, external audit when the external audit reports are not getting to the right information? Why are you doing a penetration testing when information from the penetration testing, the reports are not getting to the right hands and those deficiencies are not being uh, dealt with? All right, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Akiman Lakindia. So these are the 17 principles of uh, effective internal control as um, we have uh, briefly explained. So if you have not subscribed to this channel, can you do so to get more information uh, and uh, training uh, programs from me? Thank you.